Next in our webinar series, let's talk about epilepsy surgery. We're going to discuss phase two epilepsy surgery evaluations. And I'm really pleased this evening to have Dr. Taylor Abel join us. He is the surgical director of the Pediatric Epilepsy Surgery Program at UPMC Children's, Hos Children's Hospital in Pittsburgh. He's also on our scientific advisory board. He's the assistant professor of neurological surgery and bioengineering at the Uni University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine and the Center, and the Center for the Neural Basis of Cognition. You have a lot of titles there, Dr. Abel, welcome. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be able to present tonight. Great. So let's talk about phase two evaluations. What do they mean? Okay, so um, it's great to be able to uh, talk about phase two evaluations. And, and I think this webinar series is very important because oftentimes families come to clinic and they have a lot of questions about these things. And, and there's a lot of information on the internet some, some of which is great, and, and some of which is, is uh, maybe, maybe not as accurate. And so I think this is great that you're doing this, and, and it's great that I get to, get to do my, play a small role here in this uh, webinar series. Let me Thank see if I can get this slide. And so uh, there have already been some webinars on phase one evaluation. And just to give a brief review of phase one evaluation, a phase one evaluation is when we do everything in our power as physicians to identify where seizures are coming from using non-invasive means. And so what that means is that without actually doing a surgery, we'll do imaging, like an MRI, we'll do a prolonged EEG with, with video, we'll, we'll take some special images called a PET scan or an ictal spect, and sometimes we also do something called the magnet, magnetoencephalography, and we do all of these things to try to pinpoint exactly where in the brain the seizures are coming from. But the problem is, sometimes when you do a phase one evaluation, the information is not conclusive. And so the phase one might tell you what lobe in the brain the seizures are coming from, but it doesn't tell you exactly what part of that lobe the seizures are coming from. And when that occurs, we have to do what's called a phase two evaluation. And what a phase two evaluation is, is that we place electrodes directly onto the brain surface. We record from those electrodes in the hospital for a period of one or two weeks, sometimes longer, sometimes shorter. Just like a phase one evaluation, sometimes we'll wean anti-seizure medications. And then when the evaluation is completed, we will remove the electrodes and then sometimes simultaneously perform an intervention, other times perform an intervention in a delayed fashion. Um, and by the way, if, if any questions come up while I'm talking, just go right ahead. I will, I promise. Um, in there, and so what I tell patients when they come to clinic is below on the right, there's a picture of the kingdom, which is where, when I was a kid, I used to go and watch baseball games. And the phase one evaluation often tells us which section in the stadium you need to be at. But in able to do a successful intervention, we don't just need to know the section, we wanna know exactly which row in which seat. And that is the role of the phase two evaluation. So the phase one evaluation gives us a general idea of where the seizures are coming from. We have some hypotheses, meaning we have these ideas about where the seizures are coming from. And the phase two evaluation allows us to test those ideas so that we can delineate exactly where the seizures are coming from. 
Do and all children need a phase two evaluation? Can you sometimes proceed to surgery after just a phase one? Absolutely. And so about 50% of patients after a phase one evaluation are able to go right to surgery. And so these are typically patients that have a lesion that's or an abnormality that's clearly identified on MR imaging. So it might be a brain tumor mm. or something called a cavernoma, which is a vascular anomaly that causes seizures. And so patients that have imaging abnormalities and their phase one evaluation is consistent with those imaging abnormalities are often able to go directly to surgery. Okay. And there are two big reasons for doing a phase two evaluation. The most common is to localize the seizure focus. And so if the phase one evaluation gives you ideas about where the seizures are coming from, the phase two evaluation is used to then test those ideas and confirm exactly where the seizures are coming from. The other big reason to do a phase two evaluation is to identify eloquent cortex. And what I mean, and what we mean by eloquent cortex is a part of the cerebral cortex that contains important motor or language function that we can't identify without doing electrical stimulation of those brain areas. Okay. And Parts so, of the brain control important functions then would be eloquent cortex. That's exactly right. And I'll show an example of that in just a moment. Okay. So another thing that's worth mentioning is that I'm a, I'm a pediatric neurosurgeon, and so I do epilepsy surgery in children that are as young as a few months. But in, a, in the adult world, in children that are older than 10 or in adults, you can, you can often do something called an awake craniotomy to identify where eloquent cortex is. And so if you can do an awake craniotomy and you have a patient that would be good for an awake craniotomy, which is not everybody, then you can avoid doing a phase two evaluation if the only indication for doing it is to identify eloquent cortex. And a craniotomy is when you make a hole in the skull to access the brain, is that right? Exactly. So a craniotomy is when we make an incision in the scalp, we then use a drill to remove an area of bone and then do a procedure on the brain. I think I've heard about this sometimes when you hear of somebody playing the violin while they're having brain surgery so surgeons can figure out where their musicality is, for example, then that's sort of an example of when that would happen, right? That's, that's exactly right. And so if we're taking out brain tumors that are in, or cortical dysplasias that are around language cortex, then we'll have patients sing or name pictures or count while we're taking the tumor out so that we know that we're taking out the bad part of, the, of their brain, but leaving in all of the stuff that's important for them to be who they are. Wow, that's fascinating. Yeah. Okay, got it. All right. And so the phase, just to review again, the phase one evaluation is really about developing these ideas about where the seizures are coming from. And these ideas are often called anatomo-electroclinical hypotheses. And what that is, is it's just a fancy term for an idea about where the seizures are coming from that's based on anatomy electrical findings, and clinical findings. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Anatomical findings are where do we think the seizures are coming from in the brain? And the anatomical findings that we have are from MRI, PET scanning, SPECT, which is a fancy type of PET, or MEG. These are all imaging types that can show us anatomical regions of the brain that are abnormal and perhaps involved in the seizures. Clinical findings, or a fancy term here, semiology, are what the patient does when they're having seizures. And that can often tell us a lot about where the seizures are coming from. For example, there are certain facial movements that tell us the seizures are coming from a part of the brain called the operculum.
There are other seizure patterns that tell us that the seizures are coming from motor cortex or language cortex. And that can also give us some information about where the seizures are coming from. Or video EEG findings over here, electrical findings. When we're recording from the scalp, where do we actually see the electrical discharge? Now, when all of these three things line up and we're in the center of this diagram here, we can often avoid doing a phase two evaluation. For example, if a patient has a brain tumor in the temporal lobe and the seizures look like they're coming from the temporal lobe and the video EEG looks like the seizures are also arising from the tumor, we can often avoid a phase two evaluation, but, um, but not every, it doesn't always line up that way. And when it doesn't line up that way, we have these different ideas where we can put electrodes into the areas of the brain that may be involved and figure out exactly where the seizures are coming from in that way, based on this anatomo-electroclinical hypothesis. Okay. Yeah, the prior two webinars, we talked a lot about these various assessments that you would do before you get to phase two, if you get to phase two. So this is really helpful. Great. And so this is an example of a patient where everything lined up. They had an MRI that showed this focal cortical dysplasia right here. He had EEG findings that showed that the seizures arose right from this area in the brain here. There was a PET study that shows hypometabolism in the exact same area. And then there's also this ictal spec study that shows that that focal cortical dysplasia is also involved in the seizures. And so this seems like a patient where you would not typically need a phase two evaluation. But the issue here is that this is right next to a part of the brain called Broca's area, which mm. is the part of the brain that's important for uh, language. So it's important for speaking and, and word production. And so for this patient, we placed electrodes just over that part of the brain. And we were able to identify exactly where language was through something called stimulation mapping. That's where we have the patient naming objects while we're stimulating the brain. And then we also recorded several seizures and found that the area the seizures were coming from did not overlap with language. And so then we were able to do a very targeted resection where we removed the area of the brain causing seizures and the abnormality on the MRI, but left the language cortex intact. Now, yeah. if we had all these findings and we were on the other side of the brain where language is not involved, then we could have done a surgery without placing the electrodes first. So just again, to be clear, these electrodes that show up on the imaging, the way you put them on the brain, obviously, is you do have to make a, a hole in the skull to put them on directly. That's a, that's a great point. So there, the, later on, we'll talk about two different types of invasive monitoring. But the traditional type that we've used in the United States for many years is called uh, subdural grid placement. And subdural grid placement is probably ideal for doing functional mapping, like language mapping, like we did in this case. And to place subdural grids, you do have to do a craniotomy to place the grid. Stereo EEG, which is what we use uh, more in the United States now, is a technique where you don't have to perform a craniotomy to place electrodes into the brain for recording. And we'll go over both of those a little bit later on. Okay, thanks. <laughs> and so the reason it's so important to identify where language is, is because neurosurgeons have known since even before the 1990s, through the seminal work of Wilder Penfield, and then later uh, George Ogeman, that language has a highly variable localization in the brain, meaning your important language functions can be in a different place than someone else's. And you really don't know exactly where the crucial language functions are until you map language function through stimulation mapping. 
And more recently, uh, Mitchell Berger and his colleagues at uh, UCSF have revealed that you don't need to know exactly where language is to plan your brain surgery, but what you do need is to expose just enough of the brain that you can identify where language isn't. And so as long as you can identify parts of the brain where you stimulate and there's no language impairment from stimulating those brain areas, you can successfully plan a surgery that way. That makes sense. Trying to figure out where it's definitely safe to remove versus where you're unsure, would that be fair to say? That's, that's right, yes. Okay. And so this is a very different example from the last one I showed. Um, this is a 14-year-old uh, girl who had drug-resistant epilepsy. She was having seven seizures a day despite being on three anti-seizure medications. She had a history of hypoxic ischemic injury at birth. So she had a stroke after she was born that resulted in these widespread abnormalities throughout her brain. And so you can see here that there's not a clearly identifiable abnormality that is clearly responsible for her seizures on her MR imaging. And so after a phase one evaluation, we had different hypotheses about where her seizures might be coming from. And on that basis, we placed electrodes into the brain using a technique called stereo EEG. And stereo EEG means three-dimensional EEG. And so some people think that the stereo in stereo EEG means stereotactic EEG. And, and that's not what it means. Stereo in this setting actually means three-dimensional. And so stereo EEG is three-dimensional EEG. And we place the three-dimensional EEG electrodes using stereotactic techniques. And so on the top here, you can see a uh, X-ray of the side of this patient's head showing where the electrodes go in. And you can see here from the front view of this patient's X-ray that these electrodes go in quite deep because we're trying to record not just from the brain, but also deep within the brain. And we were able to record seizures from this patient with the electrodes in. And we found that the seizures arose from this elect these electrodes right here, which were recording from a part of the brain called the insula, which is a part of the brain that is covered by the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe deep in the brain. And so on the basis of those recordings, we, were, we knew where her seizures were coming from, and we were able to do a very targeted laser ablation without having to do a craniotomy to place the electrodes or to perform this laser ablation, we were able to ablate the area of the brain that her seizures were coming from. And, and she's now more than a year out and she's seizure free. And so you can see on the right side of the screen here, the left side of the screen is you can see the areas where we actually perform the ablation. And then the right side of the screen here, you can see images from several months after the ablation, showing that the insula has been ablated. Yeah. And so this is a more typical reason to have electrodes implanted in the brain, because this is a patient where without the electrodes being implanted, we would, we would not know where her seizures were coming from. And the electrodes allowed us to plan an intervention that would help her with her seizures. That's great. That's so great to hear she's seizure free. And so this is a uh, this is a paper that was published a few years back in Epilepsy, where some of the world's leaders in epilepsy surgery uh, published a review paper describing all of the different methods for invasive monitoring. And what's meant by invasive monitoring are is, is that electrodes are being placed directly on the brain to record where seizures are coming from. And there's several different types of invasive monitoring. One of the most common is called electrocorticography. And that's where rather than placing electrodes in the brain for several days, you record directly from the brain at the time you're doing brain surgery. 
And so if someone has a brain tumor, you go to the operating room, you perform a craniotomy, you place electrodes on the brain and around the brain tumor before and after you remove the brain tumor. And sometimes those electrodes can inform whether or not you should remove more areas of the brain. For example, if they're showing spiking activity. One of the major limitations of electrocorticography is that it's being performed oftentimes in patients who are asleep. And so the brain recordings are not as valuable in patients that are asleep than they are in patients who are awake. And so they don't give us as good of information as electrodes that we implant, and then we, we record from the electrodes when patients are awakened in the hospital. Is that because the anesthesia affects the seizure activity? That, that's exactly right. So it's the anesthesia effect, but then the other issue is, is that we often only perform corticography recordings for minutes or at the very longest hours because we're, we're limited in the amount of, in the length of time we want to record because the patient is under anesthesia in the operating room. As opposed to the grids or electrode, depth electrodes or stereo EEG where you would wake up after surgery and you're awake for several days while you're recording. I see the difference now. That makes sense. That's right. And so with the chronically implanted electrodes, we can, we can see what the brain activity looks like when a patient is in a more natural state um, in the hospital, playing video games, watching movies, interacting with their families. Um, and so that's, that's the advantage. Um, the other technique, the next technique they describe is subdural uh, grid recordings, which we already showed an example of, and which I'll talk a little bit more about later in this talk. And oftentimes these subdural grid recordings, which are placed directly on the brain, they're often accompanied by depth electrodes that go uh, deep into the brain that can provide uh, additional information about electrical activity beneath the brain surface. Stereo EEG is the other uh, more common technique, and we'll also discuss that uh, more in the coming slides. Um, there are a few other techniques that they mentioned in this review that I won't go over as much in this talk, but there are some neurosurgeons who will do small burr holes and use those to place strip electrodes and depth electrodes without doing a full craniotomy to place the electrodes. Um, there are also epidural peg electrodes where electrodes are placed in the bone but don't actually penetrate into the brain. That's also not quite as common. And there are also electrodes that are placed in perforations in the skull base that, uh, that can also provide some invasive recording, but, but don't go deep into the brain. Um, any questions about those before we go ahead? What are the difference between depth electrodes and stereo EEG electrodes? The, the main difference is that when performing stereo EEG, um, a craniotomy is not required to place the electrodes. And so the electrodes are stereotactically implanted and when they're inserted, they're inserted through the skin, through the bone, through the covering of the brain called the dura and then into the brain itself using a stereotactic technique. Depth electrodes are often placed through a craniotomy and they may or may not be implanted using stereotactic techniques. And, and what I mean by that is um, a lot of times surgeons will use an image guidance technique where they use a computer that helps guide where the electrode should go. And that can give them very good guidance about where to place the electrode, but it's maybe not quite as accurate as placing an electrode using a, a stereotactic frame. Um, and the issue is after you've performed a craniotomy, the brain shifts quite a bit. And so it can be also difficult to place the electrodes as accurately as if you were doing stereo EEG where the brain is, is still closed. Got it. So, um, and then on the other extreme, there are some surgeons that, um, that actually don't use image guidance at all when they're placing the electrodes. 
and will just place the electrodes into the into deep areas of the brain without image guidance, just based on anatomical um, uh, markers. And so uh, we've talked a little bit about grids already, but this is another example of a subdural grid placement. And so just to review the technique a bit more, um, subdural grids have been the mainstay of invasive monitoring in the United States for um, well over 30 years. And what it involves is doing a craniotomy where an incision is made in the scalp, a craniotomy is performed to remove an area of bone, electrodes are then implanted directly on the brain surface in these elastic grid sheets, which you can see here. And so you can see a grid electrode covering the frontal lobe, another grid electrode covering the temporal lobe, and then also these other electrodes that are called strip electrodes that go around the curves of the brain, and also some other depth electrodes that go in deep into the brain. And so after all these electrodes are placed, the bone is then placed back over the electrodes, the skin is completely closed, a head wrap is placed, and then patients then go to the EMU where they'll stay for seven to 14 days and seizures will be recorded to use these electrodes to figure out where the seizures are coming from. What's the longest time period you can kind of ha have these in? I've heard of some kids as long as 17 days, 20 days um, with grids or with stereo EEG. Is there a is there a when is there a time when the surgeon will say, you know what, we haven't caught seizures, but these have been in way too long. We have to take them out. Yeah, um, the longest that I've uh, when when I was in training, I had a patient that had the grids in for about a month hmm. um, for so four weeks. The longest I've heard of someone having grids in is five weeks. But in, in, in actuality, as soon as you record enough seizures, you want to get these things out. Because the longer they're in, the higher the risk of infection. And so the sooner you can get the electrodes out, the better. Okay. But it can be really discouraging to do all the work of having the surgery and then to not have seizures after the electrodes are placed and then to have to have them removed um, yeah. without treatment for your epilepsy or without with a suboptimal treatment for epilepsy. Um, another issue with grids is that sometimes the mass effect of placing the grids, meaning the grids can exert a little bit of pressure on the brain. And that can actually, in some cases, decrease the brain's activity a bit and actually make it a little bit more difficult to have seizures. Wow. And so uh, that's something that can happen. And um, so that's one of, the, one of the potential disadvantages, though it doesn't always happen, it's one of the potential disadvantages of having a grid placement. Did not know that. I did not know just that little piece of grid could have mass effect on the brain. You often see it with uh, larger larger grids or when more electrodes are placed. Um, the strip electrodes, like the ones you see here, don't have that effect as often, in my experience. Okay. And so one of the advantages, so now I'm, I'm showing someone who had a grid in the past, but then later had SEEG. And so at our center, we perform both grids and SEEG, but about 95% of our implantations at this point are SEEG. And, and I'll explain why over the coming slides. But this is a patient who had a grid placed previously and his seizures were identified to come from the motor cortex and so he had his grids removed 
and he had a partial removal of his motor cortex, but he couldn't have a complete removal uh, because, um, because we didn't want to remove his motor cortex, which would cause a permanent deficit. And so he had, uh, after he, his seizures got better for a period of time after his resection, but when his seizures recurred, we did a stereo EEG evaluation. And one of the reasons why stereo EEG is advantageous in this setting is because after having a prior surgery, craniotomy of any kind, whether it's to place a grid or do some other kind of surgery, there can be a lot of scar tissue that can make doing a, a redo craniotomy difficult. And so in this case, we were able to do stereo EEG, where we were able to implant electrodes in the brain using a, robo a stereotactic robot without a craniotomy. We then identified exactly where his seizures were coming from. And we, presented the, we were able to present the patient with two options. Um, the seizures were coming from his supplementary motor area. And so we offered him either a, a redo resection through his previous craniotomy, or um, we were also able to offer him something called RNS, which stands for responsive neurostimulation, where we could implant an electrode into his supplementary motor cortex and stimulate that part, detect when seizures are coming from that part of the brain, and then stimulate it when seizures would start. And, and um, he, he did not want another craniotomy, and so he opted to have an RNS implantation instead of a redo craniotomy. So we removed his SEG electrodes. He came back six weeks later. He had the RNS device implanted. And you can see here, this graph shows the number of seizures events he's had over time. He is actually now seizure free. Wow. And so he's getting ready to get a driver's license, which is awesome. Yeah. And, and, uh, and he did not have to have a redo craniotomy uh, to, to have a seizure focus removed. That's great. So you're saying some patients with RNS have no seizures? That's right. So some patients with RNS after a certain period of time can become seizure free. Mm -hmm. And the long-term data was actually just published recently and I don't I don't remember the numbers right off the top of my head but it may have been um it, it was higher than I expected. I, I just don't remember the numbers off the top of my head. Okay. Well, that's great. Yeah. And so stereo EEG uh, often involves use of a stereotactic robot. And you can see here, this is a picture of the Rosa robot. And Oftentimes, you can often use an intraoperative CT scanner so that after the electrodes are placed, you can obtain a CT scan in the operating room that can show you exactly where the electrodes have gone so that you can make sure everything's in the right place before you leave the operating room. And one of the big differences between stereo EEG and grid placement is stereo EEG involves very in-depth planning. And so before we even go to the operating room, we spend several hours planning exactly where each electrode should go. We get a structural T1 weighted MRI, which is what you can see here. We then merge it to a CT angiogram, which shows us exactly where all the blood vessels are in the brain. And then we, plan where each electrode should go so it maximizes coverage of the brain areas that we think are involved in the seizures, but doesn't impact any blood vessels. And then we plan about, you on average, about 14 to 16 electrodes, but up to 20 electrodes, usually no more than that. And then we go to the operating room and the robot guides us to each target, and then the surgeon just implants the electrode. But most of the work with stereo EEG is done on the computer before you even go to the operating room. To figure out exactly where to place them. Oh my goodness. That's right. <laughs> the picture I want to show here is that 
even though stereo EEG involves a lot of new technology, it is not a new technique. So stereo EEG has actually been around since the late 1950s. It was developed by Talarock and Ben Codd in Paris in, in the late 1950s. And it's been in use in France and Italy since that time. Hmm. And so it's actually been around a very long time. And, and it's not necessarily a new technique though it's become more popular in the United States recently because of a few technological developments that have made the technique more accessible. Wow, I didn't know you could smoke <laughs> during surgery in France, but I guess so, at least back then, right? Right, and so I did, I did part of my training in Grenoble, France, and there's certainly no one smoking cigarettes there now uh, in the <laughs> operating room, but apparently, you used to. So anyway, um, and this, uh, and actually just one other point, this is something called a Talarac frame right here. And so this is a special frame that they used to place right next to the side of the head and they would guide electrodes based on where an angiogram would show where blood vessels were in the brain. And so these electrodes are being implanted before MRI was invented, and before we really even had uh, CT scans. Mm -hmm. and so um, you could perform stereo EEG without the modern imaging techniques that we have today, just based on knowing exactly where the blood vessels were and knowing where brain structures were relative to those blood vessels and relative to the ventricles, which you could also uh, visualize using something called a ventricular gram, which we don't use very often anymore. Wow. So one of the reasons why SEG has become really popular in the United States is this idea that it's less invasive. And, and, um, and what, is, what does that really mean? I think one of the advantages of SEG is that we don't have to perform a craniotomy to insert the electrodes. But in reality, the electrodes are still being implanted deep into the brain. And even though I'll show some data in a moment that would suggest that SEG is safer, you still can have complications from SEG that can be quite serious. And it's important that, that your surgeon talks to you about the probability of something like that happening and what to do if, if a complication does arise. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a few slides. And so certainly SEG is less invasive in that you don't have to have a haircut to have the electrodes removed, or at least many surgeons don't perform a haircut. Uh, you don't have to have a craniotomy or a big incision in your skin to have the electrodes placed. Um, but the electrodes are still implanted deep in your brain. And so in that way, it's not necessarily a less invasive approach. Another reason why SEG has become more popular is because the imaging techniques that we have now are so much better and, and make it so that you don't have to use the Talarac frame to perform stereo EEG. And so what you can see here on the left is, is a really detailed MRI and the CT angiograms are much more common now. And this makes SEG much more accessible to a, a wider range of of surgeons. Um, the other reason SEG is becoming more popular is because stereotactic robots have been marketed and purchased throughout the United States with this idea that you can do surgery much faster with a uh, stereotactic robot than with a traditional stereotactic frame. And and I think that is true in certain cases, but the other advantage of the robot is that when you use the robot, all of your planning of each trajectory occurs before you get to the operating room. And so you can do all the careful planning of exactly where these electrodes should go. And then you feed those plans into the robot and you, don't have, and you typically would not have to make any adjustments in the plans after that. If you use a frame-based technique, 
you sometimes have to adjust your electrode trajectories based on how the frame is placed. And so make, having to make those adjustments in the trajectory on the fly in the operating room can slow things down and in, and in my view, make SEG without a robot a little bit more complicated. Does the robot actually place the electrodes in? How does that work? So that's a great question. The robot will guide to exactly where the electrode should go. And then you push the robot, the surgeon will then push the robot right next to the skin. And then the surgeon is the one who will then open the skin and the bone and the dura, and then place the electrode through a robotic guide. Ah, so, so the, the robot, robot find the exact location that you need to create the hole to put the electrode in. That's right. Okay. That's right. And so uh, when I was training in Grenoble, which is uh, one of the world's busiest SEG centers, um, we actually did a retrospective review looking at comparing the, the time in the OR for the Talarac frame and the robot. And in this setting, the robot did result in, a, in shorter OR times, but the actual difference was less than an hour. And so it doesn't really have a big difference in the amount of time you spend in the OR if you're experienced with either technique. So during my career, there's been a transition from surgeons being very focused on subdural grid implantations for phase twos. And, and now uh, in the United States, we're very focused on stereo EEG. And um, that's a transition that occurred when I was in resident training at the, at the University of Iowa. And so I got very interested in the, this issue of what's safer and what's actually better for identifying where seizures are coming from. And, and just to cut to the chase here, my opinion is that you'll get the best results with whatever technique your surgeon is the most experienced with. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've trained in both grid placement and SEG, but, but we use we use SCG more frequently where I come from, and that's where our center has become used to over the last several years. And so we're able to do it faster. We have good complication rates. And, but I think there are other centers that are more focused on using grids. And my opinion is that you probably get the best results with using whatever technique your surgeon is most comfortable with. With that said, I'm going to review some data that, that compares the safety of the two techniques when you're studying what's been published about the two techniques. And there are some differences in the techniques as a whole, which I'll go over now. Okay. So this, you, any questions about that? No, all I was just going to say was it's so important for families to ask surgeons. Sometimes these questions are a little bit difficult to ask. Where did you train on this technique? what which technique are you most comfortable with but um you know we're always encouraging families to ask the difficult questions and this would definitely be one of them is what's your experience with the training and and the actual techniques themselves that's right and so i think i think there are a couple things that are really important for families to ask one is ask the surgeon how many times they've performed this operation. And there are some surgeons that, you know, they might get a little bent out of shape that you're asking them that question. But that's okay because this is your child or your loved one or it's your surgery and you're entitled to ask these questions. And um, the other thing that I think is really good to do is get a second opinion always and so um especially now that we're in the middle of a pandemic it's so easy to get on telemedicine and just meet another surgeon mm -hmm. and um and you know if you have a surgeon that tells you they never have complications 
talk to another surgeon because there's no surgeon that doesn't have complications or who hasn't had problems. Um, and so just meet enough. So don't be afraid to get a second opinion. Don't be afraid to ask really important questions. And the other thing that's important is there are no bad questions. You should ask any question that you have. And, and I think that's part of finding a surgeon or a physician that you're comfortable with. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so on that note, uh, this in this review manuscript, we uh, we looked at the literature that kind of com looked at complication rates of SEG and compared them to subdural electrode placements. And when you look, when you look at the meta-analyses, meaning just the analysis of all the literature combined um, for about more than 2,000 both SCG patients and subdural electrode patients, the overall complication rate for SCG looks like it's a lot lower. It looks like it has about half the rate of hemorrhage compared to subdural electrode implantation. What's important to note though, is that even though the hemorrhage rate is lower for SCG, when you have an, a hemorrhage with SCG, it's often deep in the brain rather than at the brain surface. So a hemorrhage from SEG, even though it's quite rare, can potentially be more serious than a hemorrhage from placing a grid electrode. Mm. The infection rate also with SEG uh, seems to be much lower, and that's probably because SEG does not require a cranium. And so this is something that I became really interested in um, in the years that SCG was becoming more popular. And so we published a systematic review that actually took every paper that had ever been published on SCG and every paper that had ever been published on subdural grids and compared the seizure freedom rates after resection for those, those two techniques. And what we found is that the rate of having a resection was higher after having a grid placed, but the rate of seizure freedom, if you did have a resection, was slightly higher for SEG. And mm -hmm. so we don't know exactly why that is, but, but that's what the results of our paper showed us. Um, and then in this paper, we also looked at complication rates and found um, very similar pattern from what we had reviewed before from the other literature. The overall hemorrhage rates were about the same between the two techniques, but deep brain hemorrhages were higher for SEG compared to subdural electrodes, whereas subdural hemorrhages, meaning hemorrhages on the brain surface, were much higher for subdural electrodes than for SEG. And then as we kind of talked about before, the rate of infection is lower for SEG. And the rate of something called CSF leak, when you get a leak of brain fluid from the electrodes, is also a lot lower from SEG. So it would strike me as very important to ask a surgeon, for example, what your hemorrhage rate is for this technique. And if they're keeping that kind of data, they should let you know. Yes, and I think I think it's a good sign if they if you talk to a surgeon and they know what their complication rate is, because every surgeon has a complication rate, and it's I think it's a good sign if your surgeon knows what their complication rate is and can, and can discuss how they manage complications. And so in a follow-up to that study, we then took all the papers that we had looked at in that previous study, and then we extracted the papers that contained individual patient data. And when we looked at individual patient data and looked at follow-up time, we actually found that there was no statistically significant difference in the seizure freedom rates between the SEG group and the subdural electrode group. Um, and one other question we had um, in, an, in another follow-up paper was, uh, I became interested in differences in invasive monitoring outcomes 
across different countries because different countries have different experiences with invasive monitoring. And one of the observations of this study was that countries with higher physician density actually invasive monitoring is actually associated with lower seizure freedom rates compared compared to countries with lower physician density and that was a bit of a surprising result that we don't fully understand but one potential interpretation of that is that countries with higher uh, physician density um, or excuse me countries with lower physician density may have centers where resources are more concentrated and so there may, may be fewer centers that are performing epilepsy surgery and so even though the country's physician density is lower their expertise is more concentrated right so you'd have just a handful of centers that are performing these invasive monitoring techniques invasive monitoring techniques or surgeries as well but they because there are so few of them so you've got a lot of expertise in those centers i know here in the us we have a lot of level three and level four centers i think california has 14 or something like that level for epilepsy surgery centers which sounds good but at the same time again questions that the parent parents should ask is what's your experience because um you may be at a facility that doesn't have the same level of experience as another level four facility, for example. Kind of a controversial thing to talk about, I know, but our families understand this, so they're asking those questions. I, I think those are really important questions to ask. And this is just one potential interpretation of the results of our work. And, and so we don't really know exactly what's going on here, but 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 you make a great point that it's really important for families to discuss carefully with their surgeons um, what they're going to have done. And so the final thing to talk about is after the phase two is finished, what's next? And so the first point to make here is at some centers, you'll have your intervention right at the end of the phase two. So when the electrodes are removed, you will have a lobectomy done at the same time. At other centers, uh, particularly when SEG is being performed, the surgeon may delay surgery or schedule the intervention six weeks later, six to 12 weeks later, to avoid any inflammation or infection risk from the SEG electrodes being placed. Okay. If the SEG or phase two evaluation shows exactly where the seizures are coming from. If it's a large area, um, you can have a traditional type of brain surgery where you'd have a craniotomy and a resection or a lobectomy. Um, if it's a really focused area, you can you'd sometimes be a candidate for something called a stereotactic laser ablation which is something that's performed of the mesial temporal lobe or the insula, like we showed earlier in this talk. Or if it turns out that your seizures are coming from a part of the brain that can't be removed because it involves eloquent functions, then you may be a candidate for something called RNS, which we also talked about earlier. Um, if seizures come from two different parts of the brain, then things become a little bit more tricky. Sometimes if seizures are coming from just two parts of the brain, um, but you can confirm somehow or provide evidence somehow that those are the only two parts of the brain they're coming from, then sometimes resection is still an option. Alternatively, RNS, where you can place electrodes and stimulate those parts of the brain individually can be a good option. And sometimes if neither of those options are make sense, vagus nerve stimulation can also sometimes be an option. Um, and very rarely electrodes are placed in the brain and sometimes can show that epilepsy is more generalized. And this is a situation where um, we, we often don't do phase two monitoring. We try not to do phase two monitoring in patients with generalized epilepsy, 
But if the phase two monitoring does show uh, generalized epilepsy resection or some kind of focal intervention is not an option, but vagus nerve stimulation, deep brain stimulation, or uh, deep brain RMS uh, may be options. What does the CM stand for? Centromedian. That's a, that's a part of the thalamus that where we implant deep brain stimulator electrodes for patients who have generalized epilepsy. Okay. You did a great presentation with your colleague, Dr. George Ibrahim, at our conference last year about VNS versus RNS versus DBS. For anyone interested in that, I would suggest you go back to our YouTube channel and, and take a look at that as well. A great explanation there. Great. Any questions about anything? No, this, this was terrific. Um, I want to thank you for how dedicated you are to our community. You've become a friend of the organization. You went to our strategic planning meeting on behalf of the scientific advisory board. And I think you got stuck at the airport and had to spend the night there afterwards, which I'll never forgive myself for um, having that meeting during a blizzard. <laughs> but uh, uh, no, no problem. I, I wrote a grant at the airport, so it was okay. It was okay. Oh, good, good. Uh, and we'd love to have you come back and talk about something else. I think this series has been really successful, and it's just um, giving you know families that are new to this journey a, a really nice overview of all these different things. Um, we're going to have a, the next webinar just a discussion on all the various epilepsy surgeries, one particular to brain surgery for infantile spasms, and then uh, a really good webinar on, on how families make the decision. So um, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, yeah, thank thanks. you very much for having me and, and have a wonderful night, Monica. Thank you so much for, for everything you've done. All right.